Oh, hello. Um, it's Mr. Wells again. We're going to be reading uh, once again from Sing Down the Moon by Scott O'Dell. We're going to read chapter 18 and 19 today. Uh, I'll be reading it to you. A new moon showed in the west and grew full and waned, and still we moved on. The hills and the pinion country fell behind. There were few streams anymore. When we came to water, we drank deeply and filled our jars to the brim. The land was covered with gray brush and rolled away so far that it hurt the eyes to look. By this time, there were thousands of Navajos on the march. We spread out along the trail for miles, each clan keeping to itself by command of the soldiers who rode at the head of the column and at the rear. At night, the Long Knives posted guards near all the Indian fires. We now had six wagons, each drawn by two horses. At first, they carried only water and flour and blankets. But as old people grew lame or sick, the supplies were taken out of the wagons to make room for them. For those who died, we scooped out shallow holes in the frozen earth and laid them there, putting rocks on the graves to keep the wild animals away. My grandmother was the second old woman to die. Somehow she got herself out of the wagon where she had been riding and stumbled off into the brush. She lay down and pulled a blanket over her head. She wanted to die and drove us away when we tried to help her. Food grew scarce. The soldiers sent some of the young Navajos out to kill deer and buffalo, but hunting was not good. People began to eat their pets, and from then on, I never let my black dog out of sight. Before I went to sleep at night, I put a leather rope around his neck and tied it to my wrist, as I had at the crone's hut. In the beginning, I fed the little girl first, which did not please my mother or my sister. When food ran low, I fed her from my share so they could not complain. My back got very sore from the sling I carried her in. Tall boy fashioned a carrying board from brush and pieces of cloth. This made my load seem lighter. The country changed during the next moon. The flatlands rolled up into hills, and we crossed many draws where water ran. Grass was springing everywhere, which helped us feed our starving horses. Every afternoon, rain fell, and our clothes never dried out from one day to the next. It was about this time that the little girl became ill. We had a chant for her one night. Then the medicine man went over her head, her from head to foot with his gentle hands. He drove away some of the evil spirits so that she smiled and was better. A large band of Navajos came straggling down upon us. They were ragged and hungry, and many were sick. Many, they said, had died on the trail. They came from the Rim Rock country far to the west. Now the line of people struggling along stretched from one horizon to the other. In the daytime, flocks of buzzards followed us, and at dusk, coyotes sat on the hills and howled. Spring came overnight, with fleecy clouds and larks soaring from the grass. It made us happy to know that winter was behind us. Then there was word that we were only two sons up march from the end of the trail from a place near Fort Sumner. The place was called Bosque Redondo, and we reached it at noon of the third day. It was a big, big looping river, flat bottomland covered with brush. We were on a small rise, and we looked down upon it first. My mother had not cried since we left our canyon, but she cried now as she stood there and looked down upon this gray country that was to be our home. I planned to go out in search of the little girl's mother the next morning after we reached Bosque Redondo. But the child woke me before dawn with her cries, so I minded her all day and sent Running Bird to look for her mother. She came back about dark, not having found her. That night, the medicine man came and touched the little girl, and we had a sing. The night was half over, and I was sitting beside the fire with the little girl in my arms. She held one of my fingers tight in her small fist, and I was singing a song to her about a bird in a pine tree. I sang another song to her, and another, before I was aware that she was no longer listening, that she had died quietly in my arms. In the morning, I sent. I went out to search for her mother. I went to hundreds of lean-tos and fires, and when night came, I lay down in the brush and went to sleep. 
wondering what I could say when I found her. In the morning, I started out again. A young man told me that he had seen the girl I described to him and that she was living on the bank of the river near a tree, which he pointed out. It was far away, and it took me until noon to make my way through the hundreds of people working to make shelters for themselves. I saw her before I reached the river, and she saw me. We ran toward each other through the thick brush. There was an open place covered with pale grass, and we both stopped as we came to it and looked at each other. It was a short time that we stood there, yet it seemed long. Then I went over to her and put my hand in hers. I could not think of anything to say, but I did not need to. She had been crying, and I knew that her other child had died too. We put our arms around each other and stood together in the spring sun without speaking. Chapter 19 The great flatland between the banks of the river was divided among the clans. Everyone shared alike, and each family built some sort of a shelter, a cave in the earth, a brush lean-to, or a hut of whatever thing could be gathered. Our hut was made of driftwood we found along the river and strips of old canvas. It kept out the sun, but not the winds, and it was hard to walk around in without bumping your head on something. Food was soon gone, so the long knives passed out parcels of flour to all the families. There were few among us who did not get sick, for the flour was made of wheat, which we were not used to eating, and the water from the muddy river was bitter. There were several hundred Indians already living at Bosque Redondo. They were Apaches who had been driven out of their country and were being held prisoner by the long knives. The Apaches are smaller than we are, but thick and very strong. They are also quarrelsome. They want their way about everything, and if they do not get it, they fight. They fought with us as soon as we came, saying that the land belonged to them and that we were stealing it. My father and two other headmen from the clans told them that the Navajos did not like Bosque Redondo. If the Apaches wanted it, they could have it. All we wanted was a place to live on it until the Long Knives found us a better place. These words did not please the Apaches, and they tried to hurt us whenever they could. When every family had shelter and food, the Long Knives sent all the men who were able to work with a hoe to break up the earth and plant it with corn and with wheat, which we did not like. Then they set them to digging ditches to carry water from the river into the fields. Thus summer began at Bosque Redondo, our new home. My mother and sister and I, like all the other women, had little to do. There was no corn to grind. Wagons came filled with flour. White soldiers stood in it up to their knees and passed it out to us on big wooden shovels. There were no sheep to tend or wool to shear and weave into blankets. There were no hunters to bring in hides to scrape and stretch and make into leggings. We were idle most of the time. It was the same with Tall Boy. He would come over every morning after breakfast and sit around in front of our hut until the sun was well up. Then he would wander down to the river and lie in the sun some more. He liked to show the other young Navajos the big white scar on his shoulder where the Spaniard's bullet had struck him, only he told them it was one of the long knives who had given him the scar. The other men were also idle most of the time, once the fields were planted and the water ditches dug. Like tall boy, they enjoyed talking about the days before they came to Bosque Redondo. They sat around and bragged about things that they had done. They made threats against the long knives, but the threats were weak and spoken quietly. They gossiped worse than the women. The heart had gone out of them. The spirit had left their bodies. It was a bad summer in Bosque Redondo. There were ghosts and witches everywhere, and many people sickened and died. Then the first crop failed. There was little rain, and our men had trouble leading water uh, from up the river. Some of the fields were planted again, but winds blew the seeds away, and fall came without a harvest. There was much talk after that about the long knives who lived in the gray-walled fort in the midst of our fields. Hardly a day went by that some new story did not spread from hut to hut about them. The wheat flour would run out before winter came. The flour was cursed, and if we went on eating it, we would all die. The long knives wanted us to die, and so we would in some way or another. One story came to use uh, 
to use from three different men who had been in a place 15 days' journey to the north. Each man brought the same story, so it was surely true. The place was called Sand Creek, and it was near a town which was in the mountains. They said that the village of Cheyennes and Arapahos were asleep in their lodges. There was a white preacher, and he rode out from the town with some men, and when they came to the sleeping village, he gave an order, Kill all, and kill and scalp all Indians, big and little, he shouted, since nits make lice. Without warning, every Indian was killed. Afterwards, scalps were taken and shown to the people in the town. The story was told many times, and everyone feared that the same thing would happen to us. The long knives would steal out from their fort and kill us all while we slept. Yet our men did nothing. They sat and shook their hand, heads, but they made no plans to defend themselves or their families should the long knives come. Even Tallboy did nothing but talk about the soldiers and how they wanted to see us die. One day I asked him, What are you going to do if the long knives fall upon us in the night? Will you cover your head and wait to be slain? He looked at me and bit his lip. The gods will tell us what to do, he said. Now they punish us. When the time comes, they will speak, and we will hear them. My father talked this way, too, and many of the other men at Bosque Redondo when summer was ending. All right, so that was chapter 18 and 19. Make sure you're keeping up on your ELA assignments, um, your final. Actually, we had the final, remote final yesterday. If you didn't finish that, Friday uh, the 17th, we're going to have a makeup final, um, 9.30 a.m. Uh, and I'll send a link out right before that. Um, but otherwise, be ready when you come back on the 4th of January to take your final, do your book talk, and get everything finished up for this quarter. It would be wonderful if you just finished it sooner. That way you can enjoy your your break and um, just be done with it. All right. Have a great day. Make sure you hit like, enable uh, your notifications, subscribe, so you can see all my great YouTube videos. And remember, in Mr. Wells' class, it's always a great day for ELA.